The myth of Venus, the Roman counterpart to the Greek goddess Aphrodite and Adonis, is one of the most famous tales in classical mythology, told by the poet Ovid, showcasing love, beauty, and tragedy. Here's the basic story. Adonis, the son of Mira and her father Kinyris, was an incredibly handsome young man. Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, was so smitten by his beauty that she decided to hide him in a chest and entrusted the chest to Persephone, the queen of the underworld, for safekeeping. Persephone was also taken by Adonis's beauty when she opened the chest and refused to give him back to Venus. The dispute between the two goddesses was eventually settled by Zeus. The decision was that Adonis would spend one third of the year with Venus, one third of the year with Persephone, and one third of the year with whoever he chooses. Adonis, in love with Venus, chose to spend his final third of the year with her. Despite Venus's warning to avoid dangerous wild beasts, Adonis was killed by a wild boar during a hunting expedition. Some versions of the story say that the boar was Ares, the god of war and jealous lover of Venus in disguise. Other versions suggest that the boar was sent by Apollo or Artemis as punishment for Venus's affairs, devastated by Adonis's death. Venus mourned him deeply. Wherever Adonis's blood fell, roses grew, representing his loss. Some versions of the myth also state that Venus pricked her foot on a thorn of the rose while rushing to Adonis's side. Venus appeals to Zeus and he allows Adonis to return from the dead for a part of the year, symbolizing seasonal cycle of vegetation and death and resurrection. According to Diodorus' Bibliotheca, King Kinneris was a descendant of Eos and Cephalus, which would make Adonis a direct descendant of the line of Lucifer, or Eosphoros. Kinneris' father, Sandicus, was an immigrant from Syria who settled in Silica and founded a city, Selenderus. Kinneris, upon his arrival in Cyprus, with some of his people, founded the town of Paphos and married Metharme, daughter of King Pygmalion of Cyprus. Pausanias mentions a daughter of Kinneris as the consort of Teucer, who was the son of King Telamon of Salamis, and his second wife, Hesion, daughter of King Laomedon of Troy. He fought alongside his half-brother Ajax in the Trojan War, and is the legendary founder of the city of Salamis on Cyprus. Through his mother, Teucer was the nephew of King Priam of Troy and the cousin of Hector in Paris, all of whom he fought against in the Trojan War. He is known to have received the kingdom of Cyprus from Belus of Tyre for having assisted him in the invasion of the island. Teucer married Euenae, who Pausanias says is the daughter of Cyprus. Venus's temples were erected in Rome during the 200s BCE to solicit her assistance in battles and individual leaders later allied themselves with the deity, claiming to be descent from her bloodline. Julius Caesar and his heir Augustus, along with everyone in the Julio-Claudian dynasty, forged particular explicit ties to Venus, claiming descent through her son, the Trojan hero Aeneas, when he founded the city of Rome after the Trojan War. The goddess was repeatedly represented in civic architecture and on coins, the star of Venus was present, and her attractive figure became symbolic of Roman power throughout the empire. The statue, the Venus of Capua, from the 2nd century of the Common Era, was discovered in the amphitheater in southern Italy. It is the largest example of a sculptural type that derives from a now lost cult statue of Aphrodite in Corinth and in Athens. When Julius Caesar was killed, it is said that Venus was there at his funeral, and the people said, according to Suetonius, that they saw Venus take Julius Caesar's ghost and bring it up into the heavens. The poet Ovid writes about this at the end of Metamorphosis. 
It says, While Asclepius came to Rome from abroad, Julius Caesar was born in Rome. Caesar was a genius in matters of war and peace, and did many heroic things. But his greatest achievement was fathering his son, Caesar Augustus. Before Augustus was born, Julius Caesar became a god. This is how it happened. Venus foresees that Julius Caesar is about to be murdered by traitors from his government and flies into a rage. She feels she has suffered an unfair amount of treachery. She had to fight against Juno's rage to protect Aeneas, and now Aeneas's only living descendant, Julius Caesar, is under threat. The gods are moved by Venus's despair, although they can't alter fate. They try to warn Rome of the imminent tragedy by filling the streets with omens. Blood rains from the clouds, owls hoot, dogs howl, priests botch sacrifices, and the streets are haunted with ghosts. Despite these warnings, the two traitors enter the Senate Hall holding swords. At this moment, Venus attempts to hide Julius Caesar in clouds. Jupiter asks Venus why she is fighting fate. He has read the tablets written with the destiny of the world and knows that Julius Caesar has come to the end of his time. Venus will make him a god and Caesar Augustus will avenge his death. In the ensuing battles between the Roman and barbarian lands, Augustus will be the hero. When he has brought peace to the world, Augustus will return to Rome and rule it justly. When he dies, he too will be made a god. Jupiter tells Venus to rescue Julius Caesar's soul from his dead body and make him into a comet. Venus goes to the Senate Hall in Rome and retrieves Caesar's soul. As she carries it up to heaven, she feels it blaze. It escapes from her arms and flies higher than the moon when it becomes a star. The people in Rome say that Caesar Augustus is an even greater emperor than his father, although Augustus won't admit it. Throughout history, fathers yield their glory to their sons. Ovid calls on all the gods who fathered great men, praying that it will be a long time before the great Augustus leaves the world. He prays that when Augustus does become a god, he will continue to listen to the prayers of the people. This here shows how important and central Venus is to the people of Rome. These myths were especially popular in classical and Renaissance art, and themes from the story have become common motifs in Western culture. The name Adonis is often used today to refer to an exceptionally handsome young man. The representation of Venus or Aphrodite in art has undergone significant transformations from the classical Greek period to the Renaissance. Aphrodite was typically depicted as a beautiful and modestly standing or seated woman, often partially robed or nude. The most famous statue from the classical era is the Aphrodite at Nidos by Praxiteles, which was revolutionary for being one of the first full-scale depictions of the nude female form in Greek history. Praxiteles' statue became immensely popular and influenced numerous later representations of Aphrodite, seen as a divinely inspired statue. During the Hellenistic period, depictions of Aphrodite became more diverse, and the goddess was often shown in more informal and sensual poses. The Venus de Melo, now in Louvre, France, is an example from this period. It depicts Aphrodite in the middle of undressing, a theme known as Venus Pudica, modest Venus. During the Roman period from 1st century BCE to the 5th century of the Common Era, the Romans adopted Aphrodite as Venus. Venus was a popular subject in Roman art and was often depicted in a variety of contexts, including domestic settings and public sculpture. The Capitoline Venus, a type of Venus Pudica, is a notable example from this period. During the Roman Republic days, Venus Aracena was imported from Cyprus 
and was said to give Rome power over their enemies. During the Middle Ages, pagan subjects, including Venus, were less common in art due to the dominance of Christianity and Islam. However, Aphrodite did not completely disappear. She was sometimes included in illuminated manuscripts or moralized as a symbol of earthly love or carnal desire. By the Renaissance in the 14th to 17th centuries, a revival of interest in classical mythology and art had become present. Venus was again a popular subject, often depicted as a nude or semi-nude figure in a variety of contexts. Artists like Botticelli in his Birth of Venus and Titian in Venus of Urbino and Venus and Adonis created some of the most iconic images of Venus during this period. Renaissance depictions of Venus often emphasized her roles as a goddess of love and beauty, but they also sometimes included moral or allegorical dimensions. This progression reflects larger changes in cultural and artistic norms over these periods. The classical Greek emphasis on idealized beauty and physical perfection evolved into the Hellenistic focus on individualism and naturalism, while the Renaissance reimagined classical subjects in the light of its own intellectual and artistic interests. Throughout all these changes, Venus Aphrodite remained a powerful symbol of love, beauty, and desire. Wow, what an incredible journey we've been on today. Delving into the mesmerizing world of ancient Cyprus and unraveling the mythical threads of Aphrodite and Adonis. From the oldest settlements of this enchanting island, sweeping waves of religious evolution. It's clear that Cyprus has been and remains a significant crossroads of civilization and fates. The enduring tales of Aphrodite and Adonis are so much more than stories of divine romance and heartache. They are a testament to humanity's age-old quest to understand the world around us, giving form to the forces of nature, life, and death. Through the gods, we worship the rituals we perform and the myths we weave. We gain insights into our ancestors' perceptions of the world and their place within it. That is it for our journey through the religions of ancient Cyprus and the captivating tales of Aphrodite and Adonis. We hope you enjoyed this exploration as much as we did, and maybe even found a new perspective on how ancient faiths have shaped the cultures and societies we know today. If you found this journey fascinating, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and share this video with other history and mythology enthusiasts in your life. Your engagement helps us bringing history to life. And we appreciate your support. Also leave a comment on what you think about this video or what other places of the world you want me to cover. Remember, history is not just a collection of past events, but a living, breathing entity, always waiting to be explored. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you won't miss out on our next voyage into the annals of time. And until then, Keep seeking Gnosis, keep questioning, keep marveling at the mysteries of our shared human heritage. Thank you for watching, and you have just attained true Gnosis.